All right, morning, everyone. I think I'm going to go ahead and just call it to order. I know uh, we're missing Paul, but he can catch up. So I'm going to go ahead and call to order the Retirement System Board of Trustees meeting for Thursday, September 10th, 2020, called to order at 8.02 a.m. First up will be a roll call. Myself, Chairperson Lee Collick, present. Brent Nelson. Present. He's the vice chair. Kyle DeBuck as a trustee. Here. Paul Brake, trustee, is not present at this time. Julia Rudd, chief uh, administrative officer. Present. Thank you. Lisa Genord. Present. Thank you. Tom Michaud. Present. Terry Gerlich. Present. All right, thank you. Mr. Chairman, yes, could sir. I suggest um, before we get started, could we have a moment of silence for Kim? We absolutely can. I was, I was gonna make the same a statement in public comment just to uh, publicly acknowledge the, uh, the time that Kim spent on this board. Thank you. Her work was always appreciated and she was always a pleasure to work with. So she will be missed. So All right. thank you. Thank you. Three is request that the board approve the agenda for September 10th, 2020. I'm going to go ahead and make that motion. Support. Support by Brett. All in favor? Myself, I'm an I'm a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. The motion carries. Any opposed? Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Number four is request that the board approve the minutes for August 7th, 2020. There is one minor change. It's under adjustments. Um, Keith Spencer has pulled back his request. So with that one change to the uh, to the agenda, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, make a motion to approve the agenda for September 10th, 2020. Support. Is there a second? Support by Paul. All in favor, I'm a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. Thank you. Request that the board approve the minutes for August 7th, 2020. I'm going to go ahead and make that motion. Brett supports. Support by Brett. All in favor, I'm a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. Five is request that the board consider the adjustments applications for benefits as follows. There are no adjustments. There are no applications. Request that James Stalen of the Police Department, ROPOA bargaining unit, 31 years and 10 months of service credit. Retirement date of June 25th, 2020. Selected option D, 75% to surviving spouse. 56, 32, 38 gross monthly benefit with withdrawal of contributions interest of 115, 952. Mike Jones of the DPS SEIU bargaining unit, 27 years, six months of service credit, retirement date of March 30th, 2020, selected option D, 75% to surviving spouse, 1891.88 gross monthly benefit with withdrawal of contributions and interest, 8003866, request, sorry, Donick M. Ray, alternate pay of Mike T. Jones of the DPS SEIU bargaining unit, 27 years, six months of service credit with retirement date of March 30th, 2020. Donna M. Ray's gross monthly benefit payment is the alternate pay of Mike T. Jones is 1019.28. Andrew C. Isidoric of the Police Department, ROPOA bargaining unit, 25 years of service credit, retirement date of May 25th, 2020, selected option D, 75% to surviving spouse, 49.15.24, gross monthly benefit with withdrawal of contributions and interest of 81.806.44. Kevin K. Sutton of the Fire Department, Fire Bargaining Unit, 28 years and 10 months of service credit, retirement date of June 17, 2020, 
selected option D, 75% to surviving spouse, 72, 86, 44, gross monthly benefit with withdrawal of contributions, interest of 112, 465, 44. Christopher A. Lippo of the Fire Department, Fire Bargaining Unit, 25 years and one month of service credit, retirement date of June 28, 2020. Selected option D, 75% to surviving spouse, 61, 61, 65, gross monthly benefit with withdrawal of contributions, interest of 87, 20405. I'm gonna go ahead and make a motion to approve the adjustments, applications, and benefits as listed. Support. Support by Brett. All in favor on the yes, Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. The motion carries. This, this time I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Tom for legal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you'll find in your uh, information a number of Robin's gallery reports. Um, I would ask that they simply be received and filed for information at this point. Let me go ahead and make a motion to receive and file. Support. Support by Brett. I'm a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. It carries. All right, thank you. The next item um, is more in our, our theme of continuing to inundate the board with updates and memos. Uh, so uh, the, the topic of the day is uh, elections and not in the national, state, local, political sense, but in the trustee election concept. Um, we're finding that there's been a number of questions of uh, interest about how elections for the employee member position on the board, you know, could potentially be affected by the fact of, of social distancing and um, stay at home and remote access. So we put together a, 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 you know, a very executive summary of some things, maybe as just as a reminder, I don't know specifically when your election, you know, for your employee members are up. Um, you know, they typically run a couple year cycle every once in a while, but if nothing else, this is probably a good opportunity to just um, start thinking about what potential issues could come up. And, and really, you know, oftentimes the elections of trustees in my world are very, very important. Um, and so we wanna make sure that the items are discussed in advance of an election. Um, you don't want to be dealing with these types of questions of what happens in the event of a tie or, you know, some other issues about how many nominations, self nominations, that kind of thing. So you want to do that in advance. You don't want to do that in the middle of a election. So we, we bring, you know, I bring that to your attention today, not to necessarily answer the questions and resolve something at today's meeting, but to start thinking along those lines of figuring out how the elections work. You know, oftentimes you have the benefit of the clerk running, you know, running the elections. Uh, every system's a little bit different. Sometimes the police, do, you know, they do the election for the fire wrap or they, they do it, you know, the administrator runs the election. So there's not a one system fits all type of uh, protocol, but it is something that I think you should maybe give some thought to in the near term and find out when the elections are going to be held and then really just get a better understanding of how they're, you know, how they're conducted. I'm not suggesting that they need to be changed. Um, there are some boards that are maybe looking at this as an opportunity where they had the old fashioned ballot boxes and paper that they may now go to online. Different, there's different services and, and opportunities to, you know, run these types of elections electronically. So that's just a, another point of discussion, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have, but realistically, this is something just, you know, for your information and maybe start giving it some thought to see if, if, if and when there is a need for further discussion. So there's no action needed. It's just uh, be open to any questions that you have, but once again, it's just a reminder and we will continue to send you our memos on various topics until you cry uncle. So thank you. That concludes my legal report. Sounds good. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it as always. 
Um, that brings us to investments. I'm going to turn it over to Terry. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I do not have numbers for you today. I, I know when we scheduled, I was saying that uh, previously scheduled this day to, that I thought we'd have enough time to get the numbers produced. Um, we fell about a day short, unfortunately, um, due to the holiday. Um, I expect the numbers later today. I just don't have them. And I, I do sincerely apologize uh, for, for that. Um, I can tell you just to, without belaboring it, without having the numbers, um, August continued, we continue to see progress in the portfolio and uh, um, it, September certainly been choppy in the equity markets. Uh, but what we're seeing is I think a healthy rotation and leadership away from those mega cap tech stocks we talked about in the past. It looks like leadership starting to change even though they had a good day uh, uh, yesterday. I think that's ultimately good for the market. It, it, we're expecting the market uh, to, to broaden out, which provides further support. But Without belaboring the point, uh, again, I do apologize. Not, I, I will send numbers later today. We just don't have them yet. Sounds good. No problem, Terry. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or concerns for Terry before we uh, set him free? Okay, that brings us to other. which one thing that Julie had mentioned to me, which I think is a is an excellent idea. Perfect timing following Terry is that um, I'd like to I'd like to propose changing the date of the meeting to instead of doing the first mo Monday of each month because numbers can be uh, difficult to have by then proposing changing it to the second or third Friday of the month. Sounds good to me. Kyle? Um, yeah, I think that's easy. Right? I lost you at the end. Is that something that would work for you? Yeah, I think that should work for the most part. Okay. Thank you. Paul? Conflicts. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine on my end. Fridays oh. are normally quiet. Terry, would that work for you? Yes, it would. Uh, yes, it would. E even as I say, with the holiday now, we certainly have numbers today. So uh, the the second the second Friday would 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 work. Third would be co more comfortable, but second would certainly work. Okay, Ryan, thoughts? And you're not actually good on our end. But for for those who are listening, Brian Green, who actually is on the, the healthcare board, um, the state change would also affect him. So, Lee, if yeah. I can just. Add um, for October the second Friday. If you're going to meet on that day, you have to meet after 4 p.m. Richard Wilson is not available for WROK, and he only has someone who can broadcast after 4 p.m. while he is on vacation. Okay. The third Friday would definitely work in October. So. Okay. Sounds good. Moving forward with that thought, how does the third Friday in October look for the date for the next meeting? Anyone have any conflicts? So we're talking about the ninth? No, it'd be the 16th. 16th. Second Friday, right. right. I'm fine that day. Yeah, it should be fine. Okay. If everybody's good, we'll go ahead and uh, set the date for the next meeting. Friday, October 16th. Eight a.m. Julie, did you have anything else under other? No, thank you.
date of the next meeting has been set, I'm going to make a motion. Oh, you know what? Actually, worth noting is in roll call. I just want to make sure that it was Paul. Paul is present for the sake of the minutes. Yes, I'm going to go ahead and make. Yep, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to adjourn at 8:17 a.m. Support. Support by Brett. All in favor? I'm a yes. Brett. Yes. Kyle. Yes. Paul. Yes. All right. Meeting is adjourned at 8:17 a.m. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Terry. Thank you all. Take care. You as well. I'm going to keep it rolling. We're going to go ahead and call to order the City of Royal Oak Retirement System. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> One second. Okay, call to order the City of Royal Oak Retiree Healthcare Investment Board meeting. For Thursday, September 10th, 2020, called to order at 8.18 a.m. One is roll call. Myself, Lee Colick, present. Brett Nelson. Present. Al DeBuck. Here. Paul Brake. Here. Julie Rudd. Present. Lisa Janord. Present. Tom Michaud. Present. And Brian Green. Present. Brings us to public comment. There is no public comment. I will make a motion to Approve the agenda for September 10th, 2020. Is there support? Support. I'm sorry, who was that? I missed that. Brett, Brett supports. Support by Brett. All in favor, I'm a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. Request that the board approve the minutes for August 7th, 2020. I will make that motion. Is there support? Brett supports. All in favor, I'm a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. I'll turn it over to Brian for investments. Oh, you know what, actually, I'm sorry. I didn't realize, Tom, you're still here, here with us. Yeah, just, uh, just as a reminder, um, once again, on the elections, uh, just start thinking about it, maybe put it on the agenda if there's any, uh, any need and insert my prior comments here. Thank you. Sounds good. We will go ahead and uh, for legal, I'm gonna make a motion to receive and file. Brett supports. Yes. Supported by Brett. All in favor, I'm a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. All right, thank you, the motion carries. Okay, now I'll turn it over to Brian. Excellent, Good morning everyone. Um, so we have uh, August 31st numbers that I'll bring up here in just a second, but I did wanna um, note in the agenda packet, um, and I promise you this is not a cure for uh, insomnia, but there is a second quarter review presentation put together by Presa, which is the real estate fund that we have within the overall portfolio. And Presa, so that's the real estate investment arm of Prudential's insurance company. They're one of the largest institutional real estate investors in the, in the US. They do a really, really nice job of market commentary and just kind of giving an idea and an overview of what's going on in the US commercial real estate market. So to the extent you have some time, it's a great piece from an educational standpoint, just to kind of get up to speed. And, and it's not just um, Priest's portfolio, but there's also commentary on the market as a whole to give you an awareness of, of what's going on. 
Um, I will tell you, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of commentary as is typical um, on anything from a local real estate standpoint, you know, not even at the you know, state of Michigan level um, and certainly not the, the dynamics that we have here locally within the, uh, the Royal Oak community. Um, I'll pull up the August 31 numbers here. So August was a repeat and, and continued success from a market growth standpoint. Um, you know, so not only have we recovered, um, and not only are we positive on a calendar year to day basis, we're now positive in terms of setting a new high. Now we've given a little bit of that back here in September. Um, although there's been some interesting shifts in terms of what's actually been leading the market. And while it's, it's encouraging to see what's gone on here in the last week in terms of some of those stocks that have been largely ignored, regardless of how good they are, in favor of things like Apple and Microsoft and Amazon, um, it is only 10 days. So I'd be failing you as a, as a fiduciary to the system to not put some context around, you know, 10 days does not a track record make. Um, but you can see here from an index return standpoint, so S&P another huge month. Uh, up over 7%. You know, it was double what we saw out of mid-cap stocks and almost 2% of what you saw out of small-cap stocks for the month, continuing to be led by those big mega-cap technology companies and consumer discretionary, notably Amazon. So you can see on a calendar year-to-date basis now, eight months in, the s and is up 9.7%. You know, if I told you eight months into the year, you're up 9.7, the reaction largely from clients has been, wow, if I just look at the S&P 500, Nothing's happened this year. Um, but when you look at some of the underlying figures, you know, mid cap stocks are still in negative territory, down 0.4 for the year. Small cap stocks are still down 5.5% for the year. International markets, if you're talking about developed markets, are still down 4.5, almost 5%. And emerging markets basically flat. So outside of large cap US stocks and US fixed income, Everything else from a year-to-date standpoint is flat to down, you know, five to six percent. So we've seen one heck of a recovery, uh, but there is certainly the the situation of the haves and the haves not in terms of where the performance has come from. And that gets even wilder when you look at the sector returns. So this is the S and P 500 on a year-to-date basis. And to give you some context, last year, remember 2019? What a great year it was. S&P was up 31.5% for the year. The number one performing stock, or the number one performing sector was technology. It seems to be a recurring theme here. So tech stocks last year were up 50%. Energy stocks last year were the worst performing sector, only up 11.8. So there was a 39% spread last year between the best performing sector and the worst performing sector. This year, it's almost an, an 80% spread. Tech stocks up 36%, energy stocks down 39%. So, you know, last year's spread of almost 40% seemed pretty extreme. And this year we've almost doubled it in terms of the difference in returns between the best performing sector and the worst performing sector. And the theme we've had so far this year has continued. It's been tech, it's been consumer discretionary, it's been communication services, think Facebook uh, that have led the way. And things you would expect to do well in a recessionary environment like consumer staples, right? The things you have to buy rather than the things you want to buy. Industrials, utilities have all continued to languish and, and struggle. Um, seen a little bit of a turn in some of these underperforming sectors, but things continue to just be dominated by those big mega cap tech stocks. From a performance standpoint, I've come to really uh, like this chart. I think it paints a really powerful message. So this shows you the blue line is the value of the retiree healthcare, healthcare portfolio. The gray shaded area you see here at the bottom represents kind of the, think of it as the core or the, you know, the, the, the starting value of the retiree healthcare trust back in March of 17 when the bonding was performed. So starting at about $105 million. This increase here you see is the consolidation of those MERS retiree healthcare assets in. And then this steady decline that you see in the gray line just represents cash flow coming out of the trust to pay premiums. Um, so what is powerful here, and, and remember this is kind of the quick test of, you know, we bonded this, has it been successful? We wanna make sure we're earning a rate at or above the, the interest. And we're now uh, touching an almost 6% return over the 
uh, three and a half years the trust has existed. And that's market gains of about $23.9 million uh, over and above what we had started with. Um, so I look at this and say, you know, the decision to, to follow this path for the retiree healthcare trust was a successful one. And it's been additive despite some pretty rocky markets that we've had along the way. From a performance standpoint, for the month, we were in positive territory, up another 3.4%. On a calendar year-to-date basis, that puts us now back in positive territory, up 2.1, uh, but still struggling a little bit versus the policy index. And again, the, the primary cause of that continues to be uh, small cap and mid cap value stocks being out of favor. Uh, this is a trend you're starting to see shift, and when it does, it has a tendency to move pretty significantly. We go from a period of significant underperformance or significant lag for value stocks to significant outperformance, and you're seeing signs of that shift go on in the market. So it'll be interesting to see what September continues to hold. Uh, but you've still got some some bright spots here from an international standpoint. Both First Eagle and Vontable continue to do very, very well. First Eagle, value oriented, but very defensively positioned, a little bit of gold in that portfolio uh, in negative territory for the year, but had a benchmark. The Virtus Vontable portfolio is a large cap growth portfolio. So they're gonna have more tech and more consumer discretionary outside of the US. Those stocks have obviously done quite well. And then from a fixed income standpoint, continue to see positive news here. Uh, Baird, you know, this is gonna be pretty boring, plain vanilla fixed income still up 6.6% for the year. Just as you've seen interest rates fall to absolute zero. Um, interesting interview on NPR, I think it was the middle of last week with uh, the Fed chairman and comments around their intention to keep rates at this level for the foreseeable future. And when challenged on, you know, can you define foreseeable future? Is that month? Is that years? You know, give me some idea of a time frame here. And the comment was years. Um, so there isn't any expected move, you know, from from an interest rate standpoint, higher in terms of the Fed stepping in and raising rates. And they've even gone so far as to kind of remove some of their concerns over inflation, whether that creeps back in. And if we get back to super low unemployment, like we had nine months ago, 12 months ago, that the Fed isn't going to step in and try and slow things down, that they're going to want some extended growth to continue to the extent, you know, when and if we come out of this COVID related uh, recession. The other piece, uh, that addition back in June to Loomis uh, with their high yield portfolio has been extremely additive. You see since uh, June up almost 8.4%. You know, fixed income where we funded that for the same time period is up a whopping 2%. So that's been a great addition to the portfolio. And then finally, real estate, uh, no updates here. This remember prices on a quarterly basis. So we won't see updated results here until after we have the, the 930 numbers. So continued uh, positive momentum. Uh, you are going to see a rebalance occur just because of the growth we've seen in the markets. We're now over the maximum allotment from a domestic equity standpoint. So we're pulling together a rebalance just to trim that back a little bit and redeploy those assets into other parts of the portfolio. Uh, but outside of that, um, continue to watch things closely and we'll keep you apprised of further developments. To quote Tom, that's the extent of my prepared comments, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. All right, thank you. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or concerns for Brian? Do you are you still comfortable with where we're at, Brian? I mean, I know you're talking about being, you know, a little bit more long sighted in hopes of things having big changes, but a lot of red numbers on that sheet. Yeah, look, I'm I'm not happy with the the relative performance we've seen out of the the Sizert and the Ancora portfolios. So we've actually spent a lot of time. We just did an on-site visit with Sizert and an on-site visit with Ancora. Or I should clarify a, a virtual on-site, um, just because that's how everything's being done right now. And if if you know reaffirmed our confidence in the team, and in, there's while there's changes being made to the portfolio, they aren't changes that we view as being different from what they've done from a historical process standpoint, right? What they did today is what they did five years ago is what they did 10 years ago. So what's generated what we view as a long-term really strong track record, those steps that they took years back to generate a good track record, they're still doing that today. They're just out of favor. 
um, that this is the biggest difference in performance that we've seen in small cap versus large cap stocks. Like if you look at returns in the last year, um, it hasn't just been underperformance, for example, from Ancora that's hurt us. It's also been the fact that we have more exposure to small cap stocks than the market. Um, because history, like we believe, and history, you know, history confirms this, is that small cap stocks in terms of small cap versus large cap, like you want small cap because it outperforms. And it hasn't in the last year and a half. And the difference that you've seen between the S&P 500 in the last year and small cap stocks is the widest margin you've seen in over 20 years. And anytime we've been at this big of a gap, right, this big of a, my small cap portfolio doesn't look very good, but my large cap portfolio looks awesome. That next 12 to 18 months has consistently rewarded having that overweight small cap. So it's still patience from our end, but um, I'm not happy with where results are. I, you know, I'd like to be reporting much different numbers, but I'm happy with the positioning just based on what we've seen from a historical standpoint. Okay. In terms of a timeline, when are you going to recommend changes? I mean, are you, you're thinking 12 to 18 months, that's where, that's the time to, to reevaluate this, or you're thinking halfway through that time that we should already be seeing changes? Uh, if we don't see changes in the next three to six months, like, you know, it, you're seeing it now. You've seen a huge shift in value outperforming here in September. You've seen a huge shift in small cap outperforming here in September. So that's encouraging to us. Um, I'm more concerned, uh, you know, like we have the patience with the strategies because of the long-term tenure of each of the teams. So that's where I'm willing to give them 12 to 18 months from now to say, look, the market dynamics just have flat out not rewarded how you build a portfolio, right? And if you think about it, um, it, it, look at some of the stocks that have just crushed it this year. They've been, you know, like RV manufacturers and online discount retailers, like companies that if we told you we were going to have record unemployment and a massive recession, that you should invest in companies that make RVs, pools, and, you know, um, online discount retailers. Like, forget about buying the pandemic. Forget about buying Clorox, right, and, and cleaning-related companies. You should have bought um, an auto parts retailer. You should have bought Thor Industries that makes RVs out of Elkhart, Indiana, you know, things like that. Like, it's just been such a weird market so far this year that we look and say, look, I understand why these managers have underperformed because they bought high quality companies and they didn't chase uh, tech stocks. And they have no ability to know, particularly in the small cap world, you know, healthcare stocks. It's either been you're up 400% or you're down 90%. There's been no kind of mediocre or middle of the road performance out of small cap healthcare names because you were either in on a successful trial for something COVID related or not. And that meant if you were in and successful, the stock was up three, 400%, or you were out and you were unsuccessful and your stock got crushed. That's just a really, really difficult market environment for an active manager to succeed in. Okay. So you're comfortable where, where we're at. You're not, given all the circumstances that you just, you know, talked about, which I agree with 110%. I mean, you still think that we should stay where we're at instead of trying to adjusting, adjust accordingly. Yeah, I don't want to chase, you know, it, the temptation to chase some of these growth oriented strategies that have done so well in the last couple of years, you know, that's, that's damaging as a long-term investor to, to make a, a massive pivot like that. Um, look, that's not to say that I'm not watching this and, and looking at these things on a, on a week by week and sometimes even day to day basis, just to, to reaffirm and reconfirm, right? There's, there's a, a double edge to this. Um, you know, not only do I want to make sure that we've got some strong results just in terms of, of servicing the retiree healthcare system. I also uh, pay taxes in the city. So there's a, a double incentive for me to make sure that we do, you know, as best of a job as we possibly can here, just to make sure that this, Retiree healthcare portfolio is a success. Okay. Um, I understand not wanting to make the need like a knee jerk reaction and, and chase after things, but if this is also a world changing, right? I mean, 
who knows when things will go back to the old normal. I mean, this this could be right. a precedent setting game changer that just I don't want to miss that boat and be two years out, yeah. year and a half, yeah. two years out, and say, oh, well, it's been a year and a half, two years, and you know we saw things heading in that direction, but we didn't make a move for a year and a half, two years. Now we're really mm -hmm. too far behind. So as long as right. you're comfortable with it and we're proactively monitoring things, we appreciate that. So thank you. Yeah. Anyone, else? Thank Kyle, did you have Kyle. something? Yeah, a quick question. Yeah. Um, Obviously, we have this uh, massive election coming up. I'm just curious, you know, is there traditionally a market reaction if there is a tremendous shift in leadership? Uh, is that something we should be just prepared for? Does that usually rebound? Do we expect there to not be much impact regardless of what happens? Or is there just no way of knowing based on history? Yeah, so this is as far as we'll let politics get into an investment related discussion. Um, so there's the the short term answer is a ton of volatility. The long term answer is nothing happens. Right. So in the short term, like think back to 2016, right? As we were going into the election, it was healthcare changes, healthcare changes, healthcare changes, and healthcare stocks really stumbled and suffered in the first, you know, 10 months and five days of 2016. And then we have a Republican in the White House. So this idea of healthcare change immediately was taken off the table and you saw this huge rebound in healthcare stocks in the last, you know, what, 55 days of the year, 60 days of the year. Um, so there's an example of very short term, extreme volatility in the markets just based on presidential election. But then when you stretch that out to, you know, a two, three, four, five year time period and it becomes much, much smoother. So I think you're going to see more volatility coming in to the November election cycle. And then once we're out of it, you know, it, this is where it kind of goes, you know, are we Republican controlled White House, but Dem controlled legislature? You know, is it, is it a split House and Senate? You know, what does that mean? Um, I've got a piece that I can send out that looks at historical performance in each of those scenarios that I think is kind of interesting to paint the context. Um, and it's great from an educational standpoint, but when you kind of take a step back and look at it, you realize um, at the end of the day, it's really what's going on from an economic standpoint. You know, are we in the are we starting in a recessionary environment, or are we starting in a in a in a booming economy in terms of what it means for success for that four year presidential cycle? So I'll pull that down. I can send that out later this morning. That shows you, and it looks back over the last I think seventy or eighty years at presidential election cycles, and then what happens? Is it um, all Republican controlled? Is it split between executive and legislative branch? And then even within the House and Senate, is that all them, all Republican, or is it a, a split House and, and split Senate? That's helpful. Yeah, I was, I was definitely just looking for, um, uh, is it generally a knee-jerk reaction that, that calms down over time. So really nothing to be terribly afraid of or terribly excited about regardless of outcome. Uh, I, I think this November election is something that everyone is going to be terribly afraid of and terribly excited about at the same time, right? Just based on where you sit on this and given everything that's gone on. I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of market volatility, but when you get, you know, a uh, couple days away, you get a couple weeks away, you get a couple months away, that's when it's going to go from what you just said. A knee-jerk reaction turns into something that's actually more of a, a, you know, it kind of smooths out and, you know, nothing happened. The market moved higher, but it just didn't move nearly as much as I thought it would if my candidate won or you thought it would if your candidate won type of scenario. Gotcha. Thanks. Sounds good. Thank you, Brian. Anyone else have any anything for Brian? I'm going to go ahead and uh, make a motion to receive and file. Brett supports. Support by Brett. All in favor? I'm a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. Thank you. Curious. Um, under other... Julie, did you have anything? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, thank you. The date of the next meeting has been set for Friday, October 16th, 8 a.m., or I'm sorry, 8.30 a.m., or immediately following 
the pension board meeting. I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to adjourn. Brett supports. All in favor, I'm a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. Meeting is adjourned at 8.41 a.m. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day, guys. All right. Thanks thank all. you. Perfect. Thanks, all. See you.